Major Jin made every effort to escape from Okinawa and get to Tokyo, but had still not succeeded when our headquarters was preparing to withdraw from Shuri. Staff Officer Miyake, realizing that Jin's mission was futile, drafted another order to cancel it. General Ushijima approved the order, and it was sent to Jin on the southern part of the island. Before the order reached him, however, he had departed from the famous fishing village of Homan on May 30, and had escaped to the north in a canoe with a fisherman. Around June 9 a telegram came saying that Jin had reached Tokunoshima. The news shocked everyone in the cave into silence, except General Cho, who shouted, Call Jin back! No one responded, it was too late, and the silence continued. This was just Cho's way of consoling the staff officers left behind. The peaceful atmosphere of Mabuni headquarters lasted only until noon of June 4th. General Cho and several adjutants were outside the cave entrance that Monday, enjoying the sun when they were surprised by gunfire from enemy patrol boats. Adjutant Sakaguchi suffered a minor wound in his right hand before dashing back into the cave. I found bullet holes in General Cho's uniform jacket, which he had left behind. Enemy patrol boats continued to drift near the coast and fire at the cave entrance. It was no longer safe to be outside. When enemy forces realised that our soldiers and civilians were hiding in the caves around Mabuni, and using the natural spring, they attacked it at random. As a result of these attacks, corpses with canteens began to pile up near the spring, which we nicknamed the Spring of Death. Since we had to have water, we risked our lives during the night to reach the spring. Our soldiers cooked their meals on the coast, well guarded by rocks and boulders, and then carried the food up to the caves. These missions were as dangerous as a suicide charge, and soldiers engaged in them always looked grim. One day soldiers came under enemy attack while carrying food up the cliff, and one was killed. Katsuyama survived, but was so unnerved that he was unable to give us details of the attack. It came to a point where even our headquarters did not have enough provisions. Lieutenant Colonel Katsuno, the administrative officer, limited each day's meal to a single rice ball. I caught a cold and suffered from diarrhoea, so the ration was not a hardship for me. The young soldiers, however, could not stand the hunger. At night they left the caves and risked their lives to gather sweet potatoes and sugarcane from nearby farms. I advised them against it, but they ignored me. Every night Nakamura, Natsuka, Kojima, Katsuyama and Yonabaru went out for food, usually getting small sweet potatoes, which they boiled, they were delicious. Major Yakumaru caught a cold and ran a fever, but was happy as a child. Sweet potatoes, he said, are much better than rice balls. General Ushijima shared sugarcane with us and taught us how to eat it. Miyake, who ate more sugarcane than anyone else, chewed it all the time, even taking sticks of it to bed. Before the battle for Okinawa, we had discussed the matter of food provisions in these islands. A young government civilian observed, Okinawa is quite different from New Guinea. Because we have sugar cane and sweet potatoes the year round, there will be no food shortages here when battle comes. We were indeed fortunate to have Okinawa's abundance of cane and potatoes. In the caves there were many young women and schoolboys who were members of the Blood and Iron for the Emperor Service Units. Among the boys in the staff officer's quarters was a little fellow named Kinjo, who reminded me of my son in homeland Japan. Kinjo would go out at night with the soldiers through showers of enemy shells to gather sugar cane. He offered cane to Kimura and Miyake in exchange for a rice ball. The caves were so crowded that even General Ushijima had no room to stretch his legs. Kinjo, like most of us, had no assigned sleeping place. He slept wherever he found room, sometimes under my bed, like a puppy, sometimes in the muddy passageway. Seeing him brought thoughts of my son. I had heard that everyone in the homeland was mobilised, and I wondered what was happening to my boy. Was he living as we were here in Okinawa? On Thursday evening, June 7th, I heard three young women enter the cave. It was too dark to see faces, but I recognised their voices and knew them from Shuri. Lying in my bunk, I heard them tell Nagano and Miyake that after withdrawing from Shuri, they served near Maidera in the field hospital of the 24th Division. They spoke through tears, we were accustomed to seeing seriously wounded soldiers, but the caves became flooded during the rainy season, and we saw people drown. 
We spent many nights standing in water up to our waist. We ran short of food and began to feel that it would be better simply to die. We are here now because a kind officer at the hospital ordered us to go to headquarters. We shouted, Please let us stay to die with you. We will all share the same fate wherever we are. Because of our food shortage, Adjutant Sakaguchi did not really want them to remain in Mabuni. General Cho, however, said that they could live in the cave, and Sakaguchi, of course, did not oppose the chief of staff. So the girls stayed on in the Mabuni cave. On Friday evening, June 8th, enemy gunfire ceased. I went to the top of the hill and enjoyed a pleasant rain shower. Incendiary bombs filled the sky over Yoza Hill and Minatagawa. As the bombs continued to explode, I recognised a man's face off in the distance, but lost it the next moment in the complete darkness. Then by light of the flares I saw a column of about thirty people ascending the hill. They were young women, carrying heavy sacks on their shoulders. I let them pass without saying a word. These included the girls that General Cho had called back. As I had done at Shuri, I banned the girls from the staff officers' quarters. The adjutant's room could accommodate only three, Mrs. Yogi, Nakamoto, and Heshikiya. The senior adjutant searched for nearby caves where the others could be quartered. With the two generals having moved into newly constructed quarters, Miss Heshikiya served as General Ushijima's maid, and Miss Sakiyama as General Cho's. The cave was so overcrowded that the girls had to stay near the central shaft. I exchanged greetings with them the day after their arrival. The eldest girl, Heshikiya, looked exhausted, but the others were surprisingly cheerful. There was mud on their faces instead of powder, but they still looked beautiful and healthy. They all worked very hard. Some were geisha from their quarter in Tsuji town. I did not approve of that, but what could I say? General Ushijima was comfortable in his new room and kept busily absorbed in reading books and writing letters of commendation by candlelight. When he grew weary, he would grate dry bonito, katsuobushed. Grating dried fish is a good method of meditation. General Cho, whose room was next to Ushijima's, often called us in for a party. He smoked a big pipe, and when he was not entertaining, he read books. After the failure of the May 4th counteroffensive, he would greet me over and over with such remarks as, Senior Staff Officer, we had better stop this war of attrition. I can't stand this life any more. Was he joking or complaining, as I said before, he slept directly across the hall from me. I could watch his every move and usually tell what was on his mind. As to this joke or complaint, however, I could not be sure. One day I announced that I had three lice. He quipped, The lice must be fond of you, I replied. A great sage once said, The thing I enjoy most is picking lice out in the sun. I agree with the sage, there is nothing quite like picking lice. The next day General Cho shouted, Hey, Yahara, I have lice too, and more than you, I have five. Everyone laughed, of course. They were all busy picking lice themselves. We often made night attacks against the enemy but it was worse to fight lice in the dark. Through the efforts of the field maintenance unit, electricity became available in the cave for the first time. After living in the dark for so long, we were as happy as children to have the power, but it lasted for only a few days. The water-powered generator was located near the spring of death. Our electric wires were hit and severed by gunfire from enemy patrol boats. That was the end of our electricity, and the cave was plunged into darkness again. We were short of candles, so they were used only when we had to draft an order or read a telegram. Occasionally we spent scarce fuel to run a gasoline generator and light a few lanterns to brighten the cave. When Nagano wearied of his bunk and moved elsewhere, I was finally able to stretch my legs. Katsuyama made a blanket canopy to catch the water dripping from the stalactites. That helped for a while, but the blanket soon became soaked. When the two generals moved to new quarters near the central shaft, I took General Cho's bed to get free of my uncomfortable bunk. Major Nishina and Captain Matsunaga moved to my bunk room, but soon got tired of it. While I struggled with a bad cold, Nagano efficiently handled my duties. He often fumbled and stumbled in the dark to answer the phone, but never complained. When the battle situation was calm, we enjoyed friendly conversations. Nagano told me proudly that he had been the best student in his famous high school. He spoke of his falling in love, getting married, and of their happy honeymoon.
Talk of such pleasant memories reminded me that our two generals never spoke openly about their private lives. General Ushijima once mentioned that his son had been sent to New Guinea, but nothing more. Staff Officer Kimura used to plague the rest of us with Buddhist chants, but he finally quit. Now, when his duties were done, he would lie in bed, leaving only to go to the latrine. For days at a time he would not say a word, then for a few days he would sing all the songs he knew in his fine tenor voice. Once when he was silent, I asked him for a song. He replied, Using my voice makes me hungry, so I will not sing. When Miyake was not eating sugarcane, he kept busy sending and receiving messages on our makeshift radio system. It was difficult to reach Taihoku, Taipei, and even more difficult to contact Tokyo. Enemy bombardments often interrupted our telephone lines, despite valiant repair efforts by our communications people. We even had difficulty in contacting the 62nd Division's command post in Yamagusuku, sometimes because of downed wires, but also because we had trouble understanding the stations. Sometimes, when the lines were operating, they did not receive our transmission. Intelligence officer Yakumaru was always busy reporting our battle situation to 10th Area Army in Taiwan and to General Headquarters in Tokyo. He also collected enemy intelligence, as General Cho insisted. His daily reports pulled no punches. When Major Jin left for Tokyo, his place was taken by Major Matsubara, who was assisted by Major Nishino and Captain Matsunaga. Their task was to report the results of kamikaze air attacks and compile weather reports for the aviators. Captain Sayamoto's job was to observe enemy attacks from the top of Mabuni Hill, but he was killed by enemy mortar shells on June 11th. If he had still been alive on June 22nd, the enemy would not have had such an easy time taking that hilltop. Months later, after the war was over, comrades found his body and buried the remains. In the narrow tunnel between the staff officer's room and the central shaft, Captain Wasai, Lieutenant Horiuchi and a few soldiers carried out their duties. They pitched a tent because of a bad overhead leak and slept in shifts for lack of room for all to lie down at the same time. In passing this dismal section of the tunnel and seeing what they endured and how hard they worked for our homeland, I always bowed my head in respect. As our 62nd Division retreated to the vicinity of Kian, the enemy's 7th Division broke through our Yonabaru defences and, sooner than expected, closed in on our mixed brigade. In an effort to gain time, we left our forward units behind, but that did no good. The Gushichan Hanagusuku Asato action intensified on June 7th and 8th. Then the enemy began shelling Minatagawa, and it soon became their main port in the east. Our 100th Independent Heavy Artillery Battalion tried to use their two remaining guns to fire on the ships, but these weapons were damaged during the retreat from Shuri, and it was impossible to fire them. The brigade put up a good fight against the combined land, sea and air forces of the enemy, but our right flank could not even dig foxholes in the coral rocks. Our casualties increased by the minute. Enemy offensive tactics were much the same as they had been at Shuri, but here they used tanks much more extensively. Our defences had disintegrated so badly that enemy tanks could move at will. Our brigade had only a few big guns remaining. Our artillery group was supporting the brigade, but they had only tens rounds per gun to fire each day. Even worse, they were able to fire only in the morning and evening, when enemy planes were not flying. They posed no real threat to the enemy. The brigade sent an urgent demand, we are unable to counter-attack against 50 or 60 M4 tanks. We need artillery support and satchel charges immediately. Our artillery group can fire only at random, and they are shooting blindly. We need the artillery group to fire on enemy tanks. I relayed this request to Sunano, who replied, I am well aware of their situation, but they must realise that the artillery group's strength is greatly reduced. We have no effective communications. It takes two hours for our observation posts to contact artillery emplacements. We cannot rely on radio contact, but must risk the lives of messengers. Captain Yamane, commanding our heavy field artillery, reports that he is fighting alone against incendiary bomb attacks on his Yaezu Hill observation post. We try everything possible to meet your needs, but we simply cannot do it. Colonel Hiraoka, in charge of ordnance, 
reported that he had more than 10 tons of explosives available for satchel charges, but enemy tanks still ran rampant through our area. Fortunately for us, they withdrew at night, and we could then rebuild our stronghold defences. On Sunday, June 10th, the battle situation in front of our mixed brigade began to collapse rapidly. The enemy seized Gushichan, and we lost all contact with Asato, which was completely isolated. A snappy, non-commissioned officer came to the cave headquarters around midnight on June 12th. I asked what he was doing there. I led a machine gun detachment of the Ozaki Battalion. In withdrawing from Gushichan, I lost contact with the battalion. It took me three hazardous nights along the coast to reach you here. I am not alone. Six of my men are waiting outside, and I have a machine gun. We have not eaten for three days. Can you help us? For not having eaten in three days, this man looked healthy. When I asked about his battalion commander, he replied, I lost him not far from here. It seemed unpardonable for him to have lost his commanding officer and then retreat from his command post, but I was glad he had kept the machine gun. I said, have your men come inside before they get blown up. They had a hearty meal after this more and more strange-looking soldiers began straying into the cave. One time when I was working on tactics, a soldier appeared, staring blankly as he stood silently beside me. Another time I saw a strange soldier in the muddy tunnel, sleeping like a log. These poor men were all victims of combat fatigue. Some had lost their way. Others were deserters. When I spoke, they were silent and seemed not to understand. They had wandered into the cave without knowing at all where they were. Some of my colleagues thought they might be spies. Ruthless as it may seem, I had to order that all strangers be kept away from our quarters. The very sight of them made the war more depressing. On Oroku Peninsula, American marines were blocked by our naval base force. Unable to march directly south, the enemy was trying a flanking movement by way of Cochinda. Our division still had powerful artillery units, and they were assisted by the Army Artillery Group until Sunday, June 10th. The enemy avoided our front line to save losing their soldiers in vain. Our front and left flanks held their positions, but the right flank and the mixed brigade were near collapse because of a tactical blunder. General Cho and I were greatly concerned. Whatever it took, we had to prevent the collapse of our right flank, so we reinforced it with the following units. 11th Sea Raiding Squadron, under Lieutenant Colonel Oki, supported by 1,500 Okinawan conscripts with bamboo spears. 36th Communications Regiment, two companies, Army Artillery Group, two companies, Field Construction Force, less one company. In addition, we assigned to the Mixed Brigade all guns in front of the 24th Division and part of the Field Artillery of the 42nd Regiment. Our new infantry units were poorly trained. For want of anti-tank weapons, we had to use Okinawan conscripts armed with bamboo spears. They were all destroyed in one day. The war situation had changed so drastically that the enemy had no opposition. It was frustrating to see our men being killed by a well-equipped enemy, while we had nothing left to fight with. On Monday evening, June 11th, Sunano phoned and said angrily, about ten enemy tanks, accompanied by two or three hundred troops, are advancing on Yezu Hill by way of Asato. Part of our artillery group is trying stubbornly to stop them, but I see none of our brigade infantry here. What is going on? Why haven't you sent your brigade to help us? Yezu Hill is the most crucial artillery observation post in the eastern area. We can't afford to lose it. Please take decisive action as soon as possible. It had been agreed that Yaezu Hill must be held at all cost. Nevertheless, Hiraga's regiment had deserted the hilltop, taking up positions to the east and thus causing a disaster. Yaezu not only belonged to our artillery group, but was the centre of our entire operation. That's why we had put all available forces there to die in battle. I felt unjustly accused and phoned Staff Officer Kyoso to ask if Sunano's report was correct. Kyoso answered calmly. We received the same report and sent a scout there. He found no sign of the enemy on Yaezu Hill. Indeed, the enemy is trying to break through from the east, where, as I told you, we have deployed the 44th Brigade. The 1st Mortar Regiment, under the Brigade Commander, is stationed in front of Yaezu Hill, so please relax. I was confused as to whether the report of the mixed brigade or the artillery group was correct, but at least I knew we were clearly losing Yaezu Hill. 
I decided to send in the 62nd Division and issued a pre-arranged order for two battalions of the 62nd to be placed under Major General Suzuki and moved east to secure the army's right flank. Fortunately, it appeared unlikely that the enemy would land at Mabuni Beach in the near future, as we had originally feared. The mixed brigade commander, General Suzuki, put the newly assigned 13th Independent Infantry Battalion, E3B, on the right flank of the 15th Infantry Regiment along the coastline, and he put another newly assigned unit, the 15th Independent Infantry Battalion, on the left flank of the brigade at Yezu Hill. Colonel Hara's 13th Battalion, moving quickly, reached the assigned line that very night. The 15th Battalion, however, did not move from its position south of Yoza Hill, even two days after the order was issued. Unfortunately, the artillery group's report on the Yezu Hill situation proved correct. The brigade command post was unable to fix the position of Hiraga's regiment. Furthermore, they were falsely influenced by the battle situation at Yoza and Nakaza villages. They could not offer any help to Hiraga. On June 14th, I received a phone call from mild-mannered Kidani, the 24th Division Chief of Staff. His tone was now very harsh. Hundreds of enemy soldiers are approaching Yaizu Hill. Why can't your mixed brigade do something about it? The right rear flank of this division is in danger, and we can no longer hold our front line. Accordingly, although they were not under our command, we forced the 24th Reconnaissance Regiment, located south of Yoza, to attack the enemy at Yaizu. Preparing for the worst, we ordered the 89th Infantry Regiment, on the right flank of the centre of Yoza Hill, to retreat south to Maidera and take defensive positions. We asked the 15th Battalion to join the 24th Reconnaissance Regiment in its counter-offensive against the enemy, but they would not do it. This is totally incomprehensible. General Ushijima then issued a direct order to Major Nagameshi, the 15th Battalion Commander. Advance immediately to Yaezu Hill and take offensive action. When General Suzuki later voiced his objection to this order, I told him we had to do it. There was no alternative. I learned afterward that Nagameshi had been critically ill, unable to walk, but he gave the necessary commands from a stretcher. I felt bad about this, but knew that orders had to be carried out even unreasonable ones. By direct order of 32nd Army Headquarters, Admiral Minoru Ota's naval base force returned for the second time to its original fortifications on Oroku Peninsula. On Monday, June 4th, while they were still preparing defences, the enemy's 6th Marine Division made surprise landings on Oroku Peninsula and stormed inland, cutting the road between Naha and Itaman. The high hills of Nagado, near the Kokuba River, had already been captured by the enemy when our main force retreated from Shuri. On June 5th, with his force isolated and completely surrounded, Admiral Ota radioed General Ushijima. Under your command, our naval forces fought bravely to the last man at Shuri, as you are well aware. They aided your successful retreat from Shuri to Kian Peninsula. I have discharged my duties and have nothing to regret. I will command my remaining units to defend Oroku Peninsula as brave warriors unto death. My deepest gratitude, Excellency, for all you have done for us. May our fortunes in war last forever. Though I die on the desolate battlefield of Okinawa, I will continue to protect the great spirit of Japan. We had been preparing to deploy the naval base force in the Kian Peninsula fortifications, so it came as a great shock to learn that Admiral Ota was determined to defend his old Oroku territory to the end. Strategically, the defence of the Oroku Peninsula was worth the expenditure of many lives, so it was understandable that the navy would want to fight to the death. We felt, however, that when the time came, our army and naval forces should perish together. I could not bear to think of the navy being crushed in isolation, while we stood by as mere spectators. General Ushijima replied, I must express my heartfelt gratitude, Admiral Ota, for the honourable performance of your duty. The naval forces under your command and my army troops have fought together audaciously, and contributed greatly to the Okinawa campaign. We truly admire the completion of your naval mission and your fight to the death to defend Oroku Peninsula. I cannot bear, however, to see your forces perish alone. It is still possible for you to withdraw. I hope that our forces may be joined so that we may share the moment of death. 
Admiral Ota, however, was firmly determined to remain at Oroku. When he showed no intention of withdrawing, Ushijima sent a personal letter urging him to retreat. For all our efforts, he never changed his mind. At the start of the Oroku action, we believed the situation to be hopeless and felt that Ota's forces might be crushed at a single blow. They fought remarkably well at Kanagusuku, Tomigusuku, and in the Oroku Hills, however, and daily reports to our headquarters cave made it seem that a counter-offensive might succeed. But it was impossible for our limited naval troop strength to match their fearsome opponents. The enemy was closing in. Late on Monday evening, June 11th, came a message from Admiral Ota. The enemy has begun an all-out assault on our headquarters. This is our last chance to contact you. 11.30pm, June 11th. What a tragedy. Faces came to mind of Admiral Ota, Captains Tanamachi, Haneda and Maikawa, and the many good times we had shared together. The previous Tuesday, June 5th, Lieutenant Nakao, a naval liaison officer, had started for Mabuni headquarters with a paymaster to discuss how the naval base force might withdraw to Kian Peninsula. It was so dark they did not find our cave, but reached instead the entrance to the Medical Corps cave, where they were seriously wounded by enemy mortar shells. They were treated immediately, but the paymaster died. Nakao survived, but was unable to move. When Major Nishino heard the news, he rushed out of our cave through a heavy bombardment to see Nakao. They had become friends when Nishino was on temporary duty with the naval base force. In fact, later, when Nishino heard of the naval capitulation, he wanted to rush to Oroku with weapons, but General Cho and I stopped him from thus wasting his life. Another friend Nishina had met at Oroku was Lieutenant Commander Meek of the 5th Sea Raiding Squadron. Early in May, he had escaped by canoe from Kerama Island after its capture by the enemy. He made it to Oroku. There he was wounded and hospitalised in late May and shared the fate of the naval base force. While we were trying desperately to regain the lost territory of the 44th Mixed Brigade, one of the strongest positions of the 24th Division started to crack. Through skillful artillery tactics and fearless suicide attacks, the division had inflicted great damage on the enemy day after day. By June 13, it seemed that our army, with the 24th Division as its nucleus, was overwhelming the enemy assault. Back in May, during the Shuri battle, the 62nd Division, as the centre of our army, had fought splendidly from its formidable fortifications. Now the 24th Division, at Kian, had become the army's main strength, but it was declining. Despite the strenuous efforts of our headquarters and the 24th Division, the 24th's right flank at Yaezu was starting to collapse. Izuka's battalion was stalled, and the recapture of Yaezu Hill was now impossible. To back up the 24th, we sent Hara's 13th Independent Infantry Battalion, but it collapsed when Colonel Hara was killed in action. By mid-June, only a few mixed brigade soldiers remained fighting in the losing Yoza Nozaka battle. We received a last message from Major General Suzuki, the brigade commander. Flowers dying gracefully on Hill 109 will bloom again amid the Kudan trees. In the last ten days, we had thrown a force 6,000 strong into the mixed brigade front line. Most of our soldiers had only small arms and bamboo spears against millions of shells from the enemy's formidable fleet, planes and tanks. They never had a chance. All vanished like the morning dew. It was a bitter pill to swallow. On Friday evening, June 15, I had an unexpected visit from Major Kiyoso of the Mixed Brigade. This once vigorous and healthy man now looked completely drained. Lines of sorrow and suffering showed through his dirt-laden face. He reported the battle situation, and then, lowering his voice, continued furtively, The brigade is finished. Our right flank has collapsed. We can fight no more. I regret to report that unit commanders are crying aloud as they watch their men dying in vain. Whatever we do, we cannot stop the enemy. Imperial headquarters never gave us adequate support. Our commanding officers are asking if Japan will follow the fate of Okinawa. Why is there no alternative? Kyoso used the word alternative, an ambiguous word, but I understood clearly and felt miserable. He was saying that we should not die for nothing. He changed the subject. In March, I urged Lieutenant Moriwaki to leave infantry school and come here with me to teach anti-tank strategy. I cannot let him die here. 
I want him to return home safely. Will you please help me, Colonel? There were tears in his eyes. I remembered when Major Jin was about to leave Shuri for Japan, how Moriwaki had pleaded with him to teach him to fly, so he too could escape. I had often asked Kyoso to do unreasonable things, and he always cooperated, so I approved his request, as did General Ushijima. Kyoso was pleased at our granting his wish. His eyes sparkled with tears of joy. Happily, he ate some canned pineapple and drank a bit of sake. I noticed that he wore no helmet and asked why. I am prepared to die at any moment, he replied, and no longer need it. He disappeared in the pre-dawn darkness. Because our brigade was on the verge of defeat at the front line, headquarters sent reinforcements. On June 15, Lieutenant General Fujioka, 62nd Division's commander, took command of the mixed brigade and attached units to stop the enemy offensive at Yaezu Hill which had been the central key position of the mixed brigade. Fujioka deployed the 24th Division's main strength along the Yoza Maidera Mabuni Hills. He ordered Lieutenant General Nakajima, two of the 63rd Brigade, to take charge of the mixed brigade and maintain its key positions. Fujioka's action was not at all responsive. We wanted his division to assist the mixed brigade in battle, not take a defensive position. The 62nd Division was too cautious about moving to the front line. It was strange that Fujioka stayed next to 32nd Army headquarters while his command post was in Yamagusuku, far distant from Mabuni. The 32nd Army order first reached Yamagusuku through a broken transmission system and then reached Lieutenant General Nakajima of the 63rd Brigade, who remained next to our headquarters. That command channel was absurd. Therefore, General Ushijima put the 24th Division in charge of Yamagusuku so that the 62nd Division could move to Mabuni. We were well aware of the situation at 62nd Division headquarters. Among the staff officers, Kusunose had been killed in action, and although Kitajima's wounds were healed, he still walked with a limp. The Division Chief of Staff suffered so from neuralgia that since the retreat from Shuri, he could get about only on a stretcher. It was rumoured that the division was in the hands of two young officers. The 62nd Division was exhausted, but then so was our entire army. Division headquarters at Mabuni was uncomfortable, and we put up with many inconveniences. I felt especially sorry for General Fujioka. He had first wanted his final resting place to be at Shuri, then at Yamagusuku, and now it would be Mabuni. We should not be in a hurry to die, but should make the most of our life to the very end. Despite all our efforts to back up the eastern Yaizu front, the 62nd Division was now drained of its strength. Most of its men had been killed in action. We finally deserted Yaizu and withdrew to front lines around Yoza, where General Fujioka had earlier chosen to deploy his forces. The 62nd Division command post was moved to Mabuni on Monday evening, June 18. The enemy's 7th Division approached Yaizu from the east, and from the north they penetrated the high ground between Yezu and Yoza. The 89th Regiment, the 24th Reconnaissance Regiment, and the 24th Engineer Regiments, all from the 24th Division, were sandwiched between the enemy from the north and southeast. They fought to the last man, and the enemy captured the Yoza hilltop on June 17. When the 24th Division's right flank was on the point of collapse, the 32nd Regiment was in the centre, and the 22nd Regiment was on the left flank. The battle intensified on June 12. By June 15, the enemy Marines charged, and the battlefield was total chaos. For a couple of days after that, Kunishi Ridge changed hands repeatedly, with the battle situation in doubt. We knew, however, that the enemy was moving along the coast, making continuous small-scale attacks, a radio transmission reached us that the 22nd Regiment command post southeast of Mazato had been attacked with hand grenades and satchel charges. Colonel Yoshida's troops were wiped out. This simple message conveyed all the agony and pain of his soldiers and stunned the high command. The situation was hopeless. I had first met Colonel Yoshida in Thailand on December 8, 1941, at the start of the Greater East Asia War. He came to Bangkok, commanding a detachment of the Guards Division, to engage the Thai Army. I was assistant military attaché in the embassy at that time, with additional duty on the operations staff of the 15th Army. 
My task was to hold off any confrontation between our guards division and Thai troops defending their capital, while we completed diplomatic negotiations with Thailand. Mild-mannered veteran that he was, Yoshida restrained his younger officers so that everything went successfully. Strange chance had brought us together again to fight in Okinawa, and now he was dead. What a shame. On Monday, June 18, enemy tanks attacked the mixed brigade command post and overran a low-lying hill some 1,500 metres east of Mabuni to engage the 12th Independent Infantry Battalion. In the 24th Division area, enemy marines broke through the lines of the 89th Regiment and appeared at Makabe village, northeast of the 24th Division command post. We heard a radio message that enemy tanks had penetrated deep into our defence zone and were rolling into Komesu village. From what we had already experienced, this news came as no great surprise. It meant that the collapse of our entire army was imminent. It was only a matter of days until our war would be over. Explosive blasts of machine guns outside reminded me of the final days at Shuri. Our telephone lines were out and radio messages reached us only intermittently. We had to send orders by messenger. Reports reaching the dark corners of our cave gave the names of commanders killed and battalions annihilated. It was grim and disheartening, and my blood curdled at each such message. We had done everything possible, now there was not a single soldier left. Our Kian Ridge situation was fragile beyond imagination. When our headquarters had retreated to Mabuni, Colonel Umezu had me issue the commanding general's special instructions to raise army morale. Police Chief Arai said to me, Army morale was high at the Shuri battle but since the retreat it has plummeted. Naturally, morale is low at the end of a battle, but we had never experienced anything like this. The odds were tremendously against us at Kian Ridge, but we did our best. When he saw that both flanks of our army had collapsed simultaneously, General Cho said almost to himself, so much for that, I should be satisfied. At last relieved of his heavy responsibility, he seemed happier that his mission was accomplished. The battlefield was in such complete chaos that it was impossible to send out final orders, but General Ushijima wanted them drafted for issue to each unit. Nagano cradled in his arms, almost lovingly, the two large volumes of orders issued since the battle had begun. Trembling with anxiety, he said to me, as senior staff officer, Don't you wish to draft this final order yourself? I replied, you have drafted so many orders, this should really be your job, please do it for me. Acknowledging that this momentous task was something that he could and should perform, he wrote this draft for the commanding general. My beloved soldiers, you have all fought courageously for nearly three months. You have discharged your duty, your bravery and loyalty brighten the future. The battlefield is now in such chaos that all communications have ceased. It is impossible for me to command you. Every man in these fortifications will follow his superior officer's order and fight to the end for the sake of the motherland. This is my final order. Farewell. After reading this, General Cho dipped his writing brush in red ink and added, Do not suffer the shame of being taken prisoner. You will live for eternity. Silently, as always, General Ushijima added his signature. With the issuance of that final order, I felt a sudden bliss at being free of all worldly burdens. Enemy artillery, naval and air attacks increased daily against the heights of Mabuni. The gunboats below seemed to think that ordinary bombardments were not adequate. They used mortars to blast the limestone cliffs on the ocean side of Mabuni. Day and night the American fleet off Minotoga and Itaman struck our forces. When the big bombs and shells exploded on the Mabuni cliff, our entire cave shook as in a great earthquake. The cave was not as impregnable as our Shuri headquarters, but the hill terrain was so solid that small bombs bounced back like beans on a hot skillet. To make matters worse, the enemy dropped drums of gasoline from the air for incendiary attacks. The fuel seeped through cave openings, caught fire, and caused many casualties from burns and smoke inhalation. When we first reached Mabuni, the area had received little war damage. There were only a few large ground craters where random bombs had fallen. The fields had still glistened with beautiful shades of green. Two weeks of fierce battle changed the scenery completely. Hills were flattened and reshaped by tanks and bombardments. 
It was now a wasteland, the darkened terrain exposing a gateway to hell. Early one morning I left the cave and saw dark clouds rolling turbulently across the sky, with gun smoke creeping across the land. For a moment the roar of the guns ceased. I was overwhelmed by the ghostly sight of the battlefield that had sucked the blood from thousands of soldiers. As a wise old man once said, even the demons of the world would mourn at this sight. The hilltop was covered with corpses. Messenger Sunano said to me, Many of our soldiers lie dead near the headquarters cave. That is so bad for morale, why don't we dispose of them quickly? I was touched. But I was unable to answer or even look him in the eyes. American propaganda was transmitted from small craft offshore. There were daily broadcasts in fluent Japanese, Okinawan civilians. We will guarantee your lives. We will give you food and medicine. Please move toward Minotoga before it is too late. Alternatively, Japanese soldiers, you fought well and proudly for the cause of Japan, but now the issue of victory or defeat has been decided. To continue the battle is meaningless. We will guarantee your lives. Please come down to the beach and swim out to us. Thus the enemy struck not only with broadcasts and shells, but also with countless propaganda leaflets dropped from the sky. None of it showed the viciousness so typical of propaganda. They said candidly that Japan's defeat was inevitable. They spoke of Japan's leaders and their indifference to the lives of subordinates. I was concerned that the leaflets might affect our soldiers in the caves and further lower their morale, but no one seemed bothered by that. Most of them simply said, Americans always talk nonsense. I received reports, however, that some people were swimming out to the enemy boats. There were no indications whether they were soldiers or civilians. On Sunday, June 17, a message from General Simon Buckner, the enemy commander to General Ushijima, came to our headquarters cave. The forces under your command have fought bravely and well. Your infantry tactics have merited the respect of your opponents in the battle for Okinawa. Like myself, you are an infantry general long-schooled and experienced in infantry warfare. You must surely realise the pitiful plight of your defence forces. You know that no reinforcements can reach you. I believe, therefore, that you understand as clearly as I that the destruction of all Japanese resistance on the island is merely a matter of days. It will entail the necessity of my destroying the vast majority of your remaining troops, General Buckner's proposal for us to surrender was, of course, an affront to Japanese tradition. General Ushijima's only reaction was to smile broadly and say, The enemy has made me an expert on infantry warfare. Lying on my bed in the dark room, I thought about the history of military surrenders. In modern warfare in the West, defeated commanders usually surrendered gracefully to the victors. This was generally true of white race societies from Napoleonic times, the Franco-Prussian War, the American Revolution and Civil War, down to World Wars and two. Top commanders would generally be held responsible for defeats, and where commanders were killed, units below them were generally allowed to surrender on their own. To my limited recollection, there existed no cases of Western Annies fighting to the death. When an army's value as a fighting force was obviously spent, they would take the course of surrendering. In Japan, on the other hand, it was not uncommon for a losing commander and his subordinates to commit suicide. In Japan, from the 13th century until the Meiji Restoration of the mid-19th century, there are many examples where every soldier was killed in defence of the castle. In some cases, only the lord of the castle committed suicide, while the soldier's samurai lived. In the early years of Meiji, Tokugawa supporters readily surrendered to the new imperial army. Since the Meiji Restoration through the Sino-Japanese War, the Russo-Japanese War and the China Incident of 1931, Japan had never lost a war. We also had never waged a war in which large forces were isolated from mainland support. Thus, not to be taken prisoner became a fixed principle part of our military education. Since the middle of the Greater East Asia War, most Japanese garrisons in the Pacific Islands adhered to this supreme Japanese principle never surrender to the enemy. Officers and men usually committed suicide, as a last resort to avoid the ultimate shame of capture. Our 32nd Army was now faced with this situation. Must 100,000 soldiers die because of tradition? 
From this point on, it was but a battle to kill the remaining Japanese soldiers for nothing. We could cause the enemy little damage, they could walk freely on the field of battle. The war of attrition was over, and we would simply be asking the enemy to use his formidable power to kill us all. Indeed, it is a high ideal to fight to the end to maintain national morale. But were our leaders worth the sacrifice of an entire people? With the end of the war in sight, they shout at us. Millions of people must die for our nation. Why are they really aware of the entire war situation? It was foolish to force everyone to die, simply because Japan had never before lost a war. The Japanese believed that as in every other war, they would win this one, even at the cost of millions of lives. In one sense, Japan's leaders continued the war because they were afraid of losing their status and power. Why did they not surrender with dignity when they had no prospect of winning? Why did they not follow the European practice of surrender? Our fate was at an end. General Cho ordered us to write up our opinions about the battle, for the sake of Japan's future. He would send his own candid comment on the battle to Imperial General Headquarters. From the beginning he had refrained from complaining, and did his very best to be loyal. The young staff officers urged me to write my opinion of the situation, but I could not bring myself to do it. It was natural for us to be concerned about our nation's future. Japan might be able to prolong the conflict for a year or so by a war of attrition in the home islands, as at Okinawa. But just as in Okinawa, this would also have meant the total destruction of Japan. Japanese leaders should rid themselves of their ridiculous pride that Japan had never been defeated. The decision to surrender should have been made as quickly as possible, at least before Okinawa was lost. General Cho said half-jokingly, I have many followers in mainland Japan, and I have powerful friends in the imperial household. Should I mobilize them all to achieve peace? One day, a soft drink bottle containing a letter drifted ashore at Mabuni. The letter, written in mid-May by a Japanese officer, detailed the situation on the Kachin Peninsula. The enemy had them under heavy siege, and he was just awaiting death. If anyone should find the bottle, he hoped that it would be sent to Imperial General Headquarters. From the Kachin Peninsula, where it was tossed into Nakagusuku Bay, this bottle had floated more than 40 kilometres. After nearly a month it arrived at Mabuni, where the writer's commanding general was located. Was this fate or a miracle? About that same time, our intelligence officer asked Imperial Headquarters to send planes to Okinawa to help us fight the brutal enemy. Our aircraft flew over Kian Point and dropped a quantity of ammunition, but what we needed most were anti-tank satchel charges and mortar shells. Imperial Headquarters did its best, but we received very little of what was needed. The fact that Headquarters at least sent planes gave us hope, tremendous hope. Staff Officer Kyoso had requested permission to send Lieutenant Moriwaki to mainland Japan. Before leaving, Moriwaki reported to headquarters, his face flushed with excitement. He was advised on how to break through enemy lines. There were only two possibilities, the sea route that Major Jin had taken, or by land. Since we had no boats or fishermen to take him by water, he would have to go overland. This seemed impossible, because the enemy occupied the land completely, and he would have to pass thousands of enemy soldiers. Nevertheless, he was optimistic at having at least a chance to escape. He left in high spirits. We learned later that he found a boat but got no farther than Komesu. We felt that he had failed and pitied him. After the war, however, I learned that he had made it home. When it became obvious that the end was approaching for our army, General Cho also gave permission for Kyoso to head for mainland Japan, and was hopeful that he could make it. We never heard anything more of Kyoso. On Tuesday evening, June 19, I heard a rumour that Major General Shigeru Suzuki, commander of the 44th Independent Mixed Brigade, had given up the idea of an all-out suicide attack at Hill 105, and retreated to a cave in a hill near Mabuni. A few days earlier, Suzuki had sent letters to General Cho and me. Mine read, I command all surviving soldiers to penetrate the enemy lines and advance to the Kunigami area in the north. We will join forces there and continue to fight as long as possible. I thought this plan absurd, but offered him the following encouragement. While you are under the command of General Ushijima, 
it is absolutely wrong to shift your field position. After his death, however, you are permitted to do what you wish. General Cho showed me his letter from General Suzuki, which was much the same as mine. Cho must have had conflicting thoughts, but he never told me his reply, nor did I reveal mine. Intelligence officer Yakumaru set up a plan for us to follow after the collapse of Japanese military resistance. Every officer would penetrate enemy-held areas, work with our small remaining forces, and engage in guerrilla warfare. There was little chance of penetrating enemy lines successfully, but every officer must make the effort. One out of three would survive, and the survivors would continue guerrilla war until death. He whispered to me, You are an exception. You don't have to die. All staff officers silently agreed to his plan. I did not feel like disagreeing. General Ushijima approved the idea. On Monday morning, June 18, staff officers Kimura and Yakumaru left Mabuni. Kimura was to engage in guerrilla warfare in the southern part of Okinawa, Yakumaru in the northern area. Two other staff officers, Miyake and Nagano, were to return to the homeland, report the Okinawa situation, and continue to serve the nation. I received a similar order. General Cho wrote them out individually on paper the following day, and gave one to each of us. To celebrate the sortie of the staff officers, a final banquet was held that evening, attended by General Ushijima, General Cho, myself, staff officers Kimura, Yakumaru, Yoshino and Mazaki. Majors Matsubara and Nishino, who were attached to the staff, were included with a few others for a total of thirteen. We dined in the staff officers' room, which was big enough for all of us. Half of us had to stoop inside the room because of the stalactites, the others stood in the passageway. Two candles dimly lit the room. We were served fish, canned pineapple, an imperial gift of one bottle of sake, and awamori, Okinawan rice brandy. General Ushijima and General Cho each gave a short and simple speech, nothing impressive. Strong words would have moved us all to tears. Cho even tried to provide levity for the occasion. I ate very little because I had been ill for some time, and my appetite had dwindled. Seeing this, General Ushijima shaved a piece of dried fish and offered it to me, saying that it was tasty. At the height of the banquet, General Cho suddenly stood up, faced to the east, and clapped his hands three times. This ended the festivities. The staff officers prepared to set out the next evening, Tuesday, June 19. Each was to act on his own initiative, and each officer was assigned two attendants. These were 16 or 17-year-old students from the Blood and Iron for the Emperor service units. The officers planned to disguise themselves as civilians, some in Okinawan garb, others in short pants. They all looked and felt awkward out of uniform. To deceive the enemy, they assumed false names and occupations. Miyake posed as a kendo, Japanese fencing instructor, Nagano as a truck driver. Yakumaru chose not to use a disguise, saying if he got caught, he would die. Each man carried a small bag of white rice, two dried fish, a two-day supply of dried bread, canned fish, salt, and a first aid kit. After considering the situation in enemy-held territory, they started for Gushichan. Further plans as to whether they would head for Chinen or Yaezu would be decided by circumstances. The coastal road led to Gushichan, but the problem was how to reach the road. The path down the cliff went past the Spring of Death, which enemy patrol boats constantly watched. They could shower it with gunfire. Another escape route ran along the north slope of Mabuni toward the east for about one kilometre, until a hill path led to the ocean. This was the better way to reach the coast, where the enemy was more likely off guard. Either route was risky, however. This was all enemy-held territory, and we would be exposed to danger. On Tuesday evening, heavy gloom hung over the staff officers' quarters. There was little talking, and then only in low, hushed tones. As soon as the staff officers had reported to Generals Ushijima and Cho, they changed clothes and prepared to leave. I was determined to stay and witness the suicide of the generals, then, if I still lived, to leave the cave on my mission. The young officers, anxious about leaving the generals behind, asked that I please take good care of them. I wished them all good luck and urged them, whatever happened, to do their best. It was now time to go on their mission, but they still sat on the beds, as stationary as boulders. 
That evening the enemy guns thundered more violently than ever, and shells struck Mabuni Hill from all directions. The cave walls trembled with every hit. The candles were flickering their last flame. Nagano, youngest of all, as if to shake off fear, shouted, I'll take the lead, long live the emperor, and marched out of the cave. Miyake, Yakumaru, and Kimura followed. In a matter of moments, they were gone. The cave was suddenly as silent and empty as it had been thousands of years ago. I was alone, and my heart felt frozen. Already I missed the familiar voices and footsteps. Unable to stand the silence, I called the noncoms formally prohibited from this room and told them to use the empty beds. I wrapped myself in a blanket and went to sleep. Post-war investigation showed that Miyake was killed at the eastern foot of Yezu Hill. Kimura was killed west of Yonabaru. Nothing is known about the fate of Yakumaru and the others. At midnight on June 19, Lieutenant Colonel Oki, the shipping chief who was assigned to the mixed brigade, reported that he and his remaining soldiers were at the northwestern edge of Mabuni village. At the same time, several artillery group commanders, who were supposed to remain in their fortifications, rushed into the headquarters cave. I showed them the army order and told them to do their best. At dawn on June 20, the guns were momentarily silent. I saw hundreds of civilians in small groups heading from Mabuni toward Minatogawa. Everything looked so tranquil that it did not seem like a battlefield, but this peaceful scene would not last. That day there were many firefights. Soon more than 20 enemy tanks made their lumbering way up Mabuni Hill. They fired shells onto the hilltop, and this was followed by hand-to-hand -hand combat. Enemy tanks also swarmed into the villages of Maidera, Komesu and Odo. There was such complete confusion that I could no longer distinguish enemy forces from our own. The enemy tanks withdrew from Mabuni in the evening and moved east. Sunano came to see me just after sunset. I admired his wonderful spirit, bringing good cheer even in trying times. Despite the general gloom of our final days, he looked around and asked, What happened to everybody? I told him my story and added that General Cho wanted to speak with him. He returned shortly and showed me General Ushijima's order to Lieutenant General Kojo Wada, the 23rd Artillery Group Commander. It read, You will send Commander Sunano and two other officers to mainland Japan to report the local battle situation, after which they will join in the final decisive battle for Japan. Sunano asked if General Ushijima would order our final destiny or leave the matter up to us. I told him we would follow the army's final order, but after the general's death, each command post would be free to decide. He laughed heartily, saying, Considering the terrain of Mabuni Hill, enemy tanks can approach only from the east, where our artillery command is located. Thus we will be the first victims. I said to Sunano, After the old men commit harakiri in the cave, we shouldn't bury them here where the enemy can find their corpses. Don't you think it better that they die on top of the hill, we can drop their bodies into the East China Sea? I don't think much of the idea, replied Sunano, but there is no alternative. I then explained the all-out suicide attack plan in which our soldiers would charge down the hill to Mabuni. The generals would witness this scene just before they died peacefully on the hilltop. I was glad to hear Sunano add, our artillery can't contribute much to such a finale but somehow we should move some guns to Odo village. From there they can contribute to the scene by firing guns like fireworks. It will be spectacular. I was heartened to hear his plan. We went on to discuss Japan's future, about which we were deeply concerned. It was clear that Japan would inevitably fall after Okinawa. Our leaders had chosen this path to destruction. They did not care that hundreds of thousands of soldiers would die. They seemed to care only about preservation of their own status, prestige and honour. We talked from our hearts of many things. As he left the cave, Sunano said flamboyantly, I may never see you again, but should we meet again we will have another good conversation. I had just dozed off when Commander Ono, the chief code clerk, ran into my room shouting, A telegram of commendation has come from Imperial Headquarters. Beaming with pleasure he handed it to me, I too was elated.